Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reporting on Immigration Today, Know the Risks and Responsibilities, co-hosted by NAHJ and Define America. My name is Amara Aguilar from the University of Southern California, and I want to welcome you on behalf of my colleague and NAHJ Academic Officer Jessica Retis, who could not be here today. As journalists covering the biggest stories in immigration news, these panelists know that undocumented sources are more reluctant than ever to give their names and show their faces. At the same time, they are under pressure to prove authenticity and engage their audiences. Our panelists will discuss how they, as digital, radio, and television journalists navigate these new realities of immigration reporting, whether on the Southern border in Haiti or in US neighborhoods. This event will be moderated by former New York Times immigration reporter, Liz Robbins, now the Director of Journalism Partnerships at Define America, which created a toolkit for the use of anonymous sources. We are honored to welcome our distinguished guests for this important event. Define America founder and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Jose Antonio Vargas will start our discussion. Hi, um, good morning. Good morning here from California. Uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce the Fine Americans first panel for our new journalism and partnerships program. And there's no better partner than NAHJ, whose conferences I've been attending since I was, I don't know, two decades ago, and whose mission we've been supporting here at Define American long before I founded it in 2011. Um, so at Define American, we want to humanize the narrative around immigrants around the 59 million immigrants in this country and the topic of immigration and entertainment and media. We've had, we've had journalism initiatives in the past. Like for example, we had a words matter campaign urging, uh, sometimes chastising news organizations to use humanizing language to describe immigrants. But now Liz Robbins, a veteran New York Times reporter is directing a program dedicated to journalism and our approach our approach to this program is designed around mentoring, training, and research, and not chastising, <laughs> which is really key. In other words, our goal is how do we support news organizations? How do we support journalists? Um, I know firsthand that undocumented immigrants take calculated risks when speaking to journalists on the record. Uh, I did that myself uh, when I wrote my own story more than a decade ago now. Uh, since the Trump administration, not only did the threat of deportation become more real, but the fear he steered in immigrant communities and about immigrants caused sources to be even more reluctant to speak. But as a journalist, I also know that using full names lends credibility to a report, especially one that's about accountability. So how do we balance this reality? understanding the risk that sources and their family members, which I think is also important to remember, how do we how do we balance that risk that sources and their family members take and face? So this is where Liz and at Define American wrote this toolkit for reporters, editors, photographers, and documentarians. And you should all have a link to it from our website, defineamerican.com. In today's discussion that Liz will moderate, our panelists will address some of these essential practices outlined in the toolkit and offer their perspectives on the most important challenges in immigration reporting today. So I'm just gonna do a brief bio of each of our panelists. I'll start with Liz Robbins, who's my colleague. She started her journalism career as a sports writer and made her way to the Metro section of the New York Times where she covered immigration. Her stories about DACA recipients getting their renewals lost in the mail overturned federal policy, and several of her other articles were referenced in lawsuits that led to changes for young immigrants. Monica Campbell is a journalist who has covered immigration and migration within the U.S. and beyond for more than 15 years. She most recently wrapped up nearly a decade as a senior staff reporter and editor for The World. We featured Monica in a really fun video, you should check it out, where she reimagines the approach to immigration coverage. Gary Pierre Pierre, I'm honored to be in the same Pulitzer Prize winning category as Gary. He's a multimedia journalist, is the founder and publisher of the Haitian Times and an author. He's a leading voice on Haiti, the Haitian diaspora and community media. 
Diane Solis, um, Solis, who has always been so supportive of Define American, is an award-winning senior writer at the Dallas Morning News and a former foreign correspondent in Mexico for the Wall Street Journal. She specializes in immigration and social justice reporting. And last but not the least, Armando Tonatillo Torres Garcia was named in September as the immigration producer reporter for ABC News. Go Armando. He's the 2016 graduate of Columbia Journalism School and a former reporter for Univision Costa Central. He's also um, a DACA recipient. Uh, he and I actually connected a few years ago when I was visiting ABC News. Um, and finally, Daniela Garcon, who you'll probably all know from Migratory Notes is an immigration professor at Cal State Northridge. She'll be on the chat um, accepting questions or comments that she'll pass on to the panelists. So please, we want this to be as engaging of a conversation as possible. So get your questions in. So take it away, Liz. Thank you so much. Oh, did we lose Liz? I am right here. Thank you so much, Jose. That really appreciate your being here early in the morning in California, at least early for journalists. Uh, and just thank you for all you do uh, for founding Define American and really setting the humanizing tone. And it's journalism, it's entertainment, culture, research, everything we do at Define American is about changing a narrative towards a humanizing narrative. And I'm just so happy that we can do this today based on the toolkit that you have been so supportive of. So hopefully, I think we have everybody here. I know Daniela is coming along. Before we actually begin, feel free to tell me and all of us where you are coming from, uh, where you work or where you go to school. Just throw it into the chat, that would be great. Um, we do not have a translation, and uh, at this point, I know we had discussed it, but um, feel free to, to ask any questions that you have or hang on to it. Um, I, I'm sorry that we do not have that today, but uh, we will certainly have this recorded and uh, can work on that as well. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to anyone here from the Columbia J School chapter of NAHJ. Uh, in November, they hosted this amazing event that was very similar to this. It was a discussion on immigration reporting. And I raced up to Columbia because I'm in New York City and I attended that both Zoom panel and live. And all of the panelists, professional journalists were saying, gosh, I really wish there was a guide for this because we're talking about all this. And I said, wait, Hang on, there is one coming. I'm working on it. It'll be out soon. Well, today it's officially out and I'm so excited to be able to talk about the principles, some of the advice that I solicited and many of the people here uh, on the, on the um, discussion can talk about. And we'll share that with you afterwards, but also integrate as we talk. What I'd love for you to do is also, if you have questions, put them in the chat while we're going on. I want this to be a very interactive discussion. We are all journalists here. I'm sure we have tons of questions. So please feel free to do that. Um, and I wanna just get started. It's 12.09 and I know your time is very valuable. So let's get started with the first question. Now we have our four panelists here, and uh, if it's at all possible to just spotlight our four panelists, that would be great. Okay, so this is a question for Monica and Gary and uh, Diane and Armando, and I may start with Diane first. What has changed about immigration reporting in the years since you've been covering it. Now, I know Armando, you came out of Columbia 2016, but there have been a lot of changes in the last five years alone. So I know you can talk about this too, but what has changed that has made you both understand the risks even more and take steps to mitigate these risks when you are dealing with undocumented uh, sources, migrants, anyone in the field. And I'd like to start with Diane about what has changed most, what you have noticed about these risks. 
I think in the last year, one of the things that has struck me is that there is a threat to the undocumented from within our country, from the person down the street, the person at the grocery store. And there's a tolerance and even a movement of, uh, of people on the extreme. And we have, we have to be aware of that when we're interviewing the undocumented and calculating the risk. And, and the, the, another thing that we don't think about all that much or report on enough is I think there's a, a mental health fatigue among immigrants, uh, whether they are here with green cards or whether they have DACA, especially if they have DACA, uh, or whether they're undocumented. And they bring that burden to an interview. And it's important for us to be particularly sensitive as we interview people within the US. And that's changed. And, and we know that the priorities for who gets deported are back with Biden. But that doesn't mitigate these other issues of the fatigue and and the threat within the US. That's a great point. I'm so glad you brought up uh, mental health. Certainly it is a huge issue across all areas, not only uh, in what we're reporting on, on immigrants, but and we've seen it in sports, of course, I have to mention that. But we at Define American produced this report, uh, American Dreaming, about the mental health toll on uh, advocates and activists who are dreamers. And it's so important. That's why a lot of these steps that you take as reporters, really you have to consider what is the, what is the toll, what is the trauma that they will have when they relive their experiences. Armando, I'm gonna to go to you now. You know, I think people are the most fearful now that I've ever seen. Um, and I think one thing that we gotta remember is, you know, when we talk about um, uh, under the, the Trump administration, under the Biden administration, right now, two of the three harshest immigration policies installed by President Trump are still in play. That's MPP, that's Title 42, and uh, several other policies that are still in play right now. So, you know, I think when speaking with, with undocumented sources, it's really important to, to take into consideration the risks that people are, are placing themselves under and also placing their families under. You know, when I interview somebody who's a DACA recipient like myself, I know that there are 22 million people in the United States that live in mixed status families. So when you're interviewing somebody who has TPS or, or, or DACA or some other protection, you're also implicitly and unknowingly sometimes interviewing or talking about family members that might not enjoy those protections. So I think one question that I like to ask right off the bat that I think can mitigate some of those risks is, uh, is simply, you know, how, how can I share your story in a way that you are comfortable with it? Or how can I make you feel more comfortable to share your story? And I think just starting your, your interaction with anybody who might be undocumented with that question will kind of ease uh, that stress a little bit and just have it be a more free flowing and natural conversation. Armando, are, are people surprised when you actually approach them that way? How would you like to share your story? Because that's not often what people expect, sadly, from journalists. What do they say to you? I think so. I think so. You know, and I, I think, you know, I see I see relief on people's faces. And, and I understand that, you know, sometimes we're in situations like in Del Rio, where there's a lot of moving parts where we might not have that opportunity to ask everybody individually. And I think we can certainly get into that a little bit later on the conversation. But there are ways, you know, for me, coming from a broadcast uh, uh, perspective, there are ways to film a chaotic uh, environment or a, or a, or a chaotic uh, scene without, you know, exposing people to, to greater threat or exploiting their um, uh, or outing them or, you know, just still keeping them uh, anonymous, whether that's, you know, shooting at their uh, feet or, you know, doing a wide shot so that you're not focused on anybody's face in particular, you know, there's ways to kind of mitigate that risk. I love the communication that that's what I want to stress today, communicating with your sources. Monica, what, what have you noticed in your decades of reporting and especially for audio? Sure. Well, with radio, well, thank you so much for hosting this. I just want to give a shout out. I see a lot of familiar names uh, and faces out here. So it's, it's really nice to be able to connect. Um, 
I, radio can be more forgiving, Armando, uh, hats off, because video is really hard, and uh, with print, that also has its own dynamic. But, um, you know, even with people's voices, that is still something where we have to be careful. It's not an assumption that somebody, you know, because they're not having their face on camera, that they'll feel comfortable just speaking into a microphone. I'm thinking of people who, um, you know, for example, when COVID was going through the detention centers in the United States, like wildfire, if you were somebody from a country, for example, I know with folks from Cameroon, um, if there were only a few Cameroonians in a detention center, their voice may out them. So that was something where, you know, we had to be careful about including somebody's voice in a particular situation where that might not be enough. And I think um, just, you know, kind of not falling into the pressure to have to identify somebody. I know that is something that we all face, that you want the full name. And I think that is ideal in many instances. But I think that if you can explain to your audience, your, your listeners, why you're not including this full, the person's full name, I think it actually can add a lot of understanding and depth to the story and beyond just saying, you know, for security reasons, we're not including this person's full name. Give more, give more detail about that without, you know, giving away why you're protecting them in that moment. And I think you just kind of bring your listeners or your audience more into the process. What other details would you add, Monica, besides we're protecting them for security? I mean, going back to the detention center example, I think um, why somebody may feel that they, they would be retaliated against by the folks who are um, keeping them in custody, where we saw that documented throughout the pandemic. Uh, you know, those allegations were, were very um, common. So to explain that that is why you are not including that person's full identity, that can give insight into why they're even speaking at all. Um, I think other reasons um, like Armando brought up mixed status families, maybe they feel comfortable, but perhaps perhaps their child is not aware of their status. Perhaps that is not a conversation that you know the kid's not old enough to have had with their parent. So these are really complex situations and you want to make sure that you you know you, you honor the complexities of someone's life. Thank you, Monica. And last but not least, Gary, you bring in such a great perspective. Uh, both as an editor and a reporter, a columnist at the Haitian Times. When you uh, have seen this transition um, in the last 25 years, really, what strikes you about what's different now? And what do you tell your reporters in protecting their sources? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be in the company of Jose, uh, who is also a Pulitzer Prize winner, <laughs> as he mentioned. <laughs> um, you know, Liz, one of the things that I've noticed is a different type of, of, of reporters covering immigration now. Uh, you have a lot of uh, Asian reporters, you have a lot of Latino reporters. And so they bring a certain sense of sensitivity and understanding that I didn't see, let's say, 20 years ago, where the focus was mostly on the policy of immigration not the immigrants. And I think that has changed tremendously. And we saw it last summer in, in Del Rio. And I think uh, the reporters did a great job of connecting with Haitian, although many of them spoke Spanish, but that you could tell there was a, 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 a camaraderie, a, a, a understanding of what was happening that I've never seen before in the past where the focus would have been on the border patrol, but this time, I think the focus remained on the migrants' uh, travels throughout Latin America until they got, they got to uh, the border. And I think also you have, uh, and I put her on the spot, the work that Daniela uh, has done over the years, uh, 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 keeping the, the issue of immigration to the fore so that reporters who are interested in covering or are covering the beat had resources to fall back on. And, one of the things I want to uh, uh, say about protecting sources, you know, our DNA is, 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 is that, because we do, we cover Haitians and, and, and uh, most of our audience is Haitian. And so, you know, we know the reality and we do not expose anybody's uh, uh, anyway, 
shape or form. What we do, however, is that we describe the person in vivid details so that the reader knows it's a mother of two who's in her twenties and uh, who uh, just details that that brings a person alive, so that the, the the audience knows that that this person exists, and so there's a connection that happens, and they understand. We also work very closely with uh, activists, advocates, and lawyers to 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 prep people for us before we 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 talk to them, so we know their story, and that's I think that's a great way to get inside. Of, of 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 reporting on immigrants as opposed to immigration, where you know you need them to trust you, and and it, it's a very a difficult period in someone's life when when you're moving, seeking uh, migration somewhere, and usually you you're leaving a really bad situation as trauma to really open yourself up to a complete stranger asking you the most intimate questions. So you know uh, um, it, it's good to have someone to be able to uh, make that connection for you and, and, and prep you on the, 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 the situation of, of, of the person that you're interviewing. I'm so glad you brought that up because this is both a benefit, but also sometimes can be a bit of a sticking point for journalists dealing with uh, nonprofits, advocates, NGOs of any kind and lawyers who sometimes are very strict about what you can and can't say. So there's two sides of it. I have worked with lawyers who I want to make sure we involve in the conversation because they know best for their client. But does that take away the agency of the immigrant? Monica, I'm going to ask you that because we had talked about this last week. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's um, very common that when you have a big story, particularly one that might involve a lawsuit or people in very hard parts of the world to reach, the advocacy groups are in touch with those folks, um, and they can be the the go between between um, you know having a, a human voice or somebody who's at the center of the story or not. Uh, in some cases, that is the case. Um, I think we should always make the best effort possible to have our to be well sourced so that we have people in the community that's being affected, where we can also ask. Um, and try and seek out sources beyond those that are directly related to advocacy groups. So that's that can take time, but it can also mean um, that you have relationships with communities built in, and that you're that's part of your DNA as a reporter. So that when a big story happens in a particular community, you are not you know somebody who's just new on the scene there with them that you have some ties and that in some ways those, those voices that are not connected to advocacy groups can be extremely valuable because they may break a set narrative that some groups may want to you know, have in place. They can complicate the way an immigrant community uh, sees a particular story. So I just always try and have as many um, folks in as possible within a variety of different communities available and keeping in touch with those folks is important so that you just don't rely on one big group to serve up somebody. And um, I think it's just, you know, that takes time, but it's well, it's time well spent. Diane, you're, you're nodding along with that. <laughs> Do you have anything to, to add to, to Monica? You've been developing sources for so long and I know the two of you worked in Mexico City together. Um, what would your advice be, your, either cautionary or any other advice in working with NGOs or lawyers to set up a story? I think it's very important to, uh, to know these players and uh, uh, they'll help deepen your understanding of the legal complexities of immigration and and there are and it is really complicated but it, it's also important to just know immigrants themselves without the filter yeah and one way to do that is to go to community festivals for example and and to meet people um I was for a while attending refugee resettlement meetings in which there were real former refugees there, right? And real immigrants there. And we would just chat. Uh, one of them was from Ukraine and is on the front page of 
uh, my publication this morning, right? And we built a relationship over, over a few years, and that was really helpful. And there's no filter there. There's no lawyer standing in between of this very human story right now of fight or flight. Thank you. I, I, that is so, so good to remember to just go, <laughs> to just walk on the streets, to go to festivals, to go to dinners, to meet people away from the organized events. All right, Armando, you're nodding. I'm gonna switch a little bit and go to some specific advice that you could give us about not only negotiating with sources to protect their um, identity, but really the conversations you've had in the first several months with your bosses. You are a producer as well as a reporter, but what are the conversations that you have about saying, no, 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 wait a second. This is really crucial. We have to be careful. Can you share one of those? Sure thing where uh, last week we had a group out in Reynosa. And I think one of the most important things that people need to know about uh, camps like Reynosa is that often when they are in these camps, this is so for, for many people, the most dangerous part of their journey because they're literally just sitting there. They're, they're there for a really long time waiting for their asylum cases to be processed in some cases. So they're really easily, you know, they can easily fall prey to, to um, uh, armed groups, carteles, or other people who are in the area who kind of control the area might take advantage of them. So one conversation that we had last week was about blurring faces. You know, for people that we didn't explicitly ask for for permission to to film their faces or to film their children we blurred it and sure you know does is is that um uh, for lack of a better word as uh, uh um it, it it might not be the, the the prettiest image you know to to show on tv but i think yeah. as was mentioned earlier today one thing that we really stressed is why are we doing this so not only as you're transparent with immigrant sources and undocumented sources you also have to be transparent with your viewers, your readers, your listeners about why it is you're going the extra mile to protect those people. So one of the things we did is we blurred a lot of faces. Uh, you know, uh, we we filmed their hands instead, or we or we filmed their feet. You know, whatever they felt comfortable. Sometimes we've been known to um, uh, film people in silhouette. It really depends on a case by case basis, and it re really depends on what people themselves feel most comfortable with. Terrific. I'm going to uh, stop and answer some quick questions here. Actually, they're not all that quick, but I'm going to propose uh, them to the panel. And the first one's from Jordan Call uh, at the NAHJ Columbia chapter. So up the block, another shout out to them. But um, Jordan is, is asked this great question about how do you go about reporting um, when the subject doesn't know a lot and uh, came, um, this person was three when he arrived. And that also goes with Alexis's question about how do you verify the veracity of your source's story? Um, maybe I could throw this to uh, both Monica and Diane and also Gary as an editor. Um, Monica, do you wanna take that first about verifying? And then Armando too, you can talk about this. Whoever wants to jump in. Monica, you're up first. Sure. Um, you know, I think verifying sources, it can be tricky because you can meet folks where they're at and they may have no documentation at all on them. Um, perhaps they, you know, that is why they are at the border or, or, or in some part of the world that they've actually been stripped of their belongings by that point, or they just don't have, you know, they're from a part of the world where you don't get a birth certificate or, um, they, they haven't had any sort of you know, registration uh, interaction with officials. In that case, there is an element of, um, you know, you, you, you might not be able to verify that story. And that's where your antenna has to be particularly sharp, where you may take some time, extra time, just to speak about somebody, about their background and their story. Um, you know, it's a fine line because you don't want to, you know, you don't want it to be an interrogation. But I think that is just a, a reality of some of these stories. Um, I think in terms of verification though, when there is, uh, when you can do it, for example, um, I was doing a lot of reporting on folks from Afghanistan who were um, trying to get to the United States. 
they had documentation in Afghanistan while they were there that they could share with me. That really important uh, element there was sharing it safely. So that was, uh, how do you, how would you like to share that documentation um, that you've received from the US forces? And that was often over signal, for example. So you wow. really wanna make sure that how you're asking people to verify or send along any sort of documentation doesn't put them at extra risk. Um, that might not be an assumption and you may walk people through joining signal and that sort of thing. So that's, you know, you wanna make sure that um, you're keeping their safety uh, uh, you know, first priority throughout the process. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Gary, for you mentioned sources in um, in Haiti, and that you try and, or even in the community, you you only identify them as mother of two. But do you? How do you tell your reporters? Make sure you go to their Facebook page or try to talk to a grandmother to verify. What is your advice on that? Well, I mean, for the most part, uh, we, we going into it this way, we believe the fundamentals of, of the story because this is not the first time that we, we, we are reporting on this particular uh, situation. It, to us, it's just, okay, tell us your story. We wanna tell different voices because right. we, we, we know that where they came from, we know the journey. And so we're just trying to fill in the gaps. And so when we talk to a source, what we want to know is, is to flesh it out. We want to bring it that person alive. We want to humanize that source. And so um, we don't expect people to remember every detail of everything because it's just not possible. But what we want is just like the story at its core is it's true. And that's the way we go into it, as opposed to like, uh, I think Diane mentioned, or Monica just mentioned that, you know, you don't want it, this to be an interrogation, you know, it's just conversation yeah. and, and tell me about you and, and make the person feel at ease. And so that they can tell you as much, as much information as possible. And the identity, uh, oftentimes, I mean, we people will show us their, their, their passports if they have it, they, they, they do provide some sort of identification that we choose to withhold. Uh, and we also, to go back, it, it, do not rely exclusively on, on um, lawyers and advocate, but sometimes they have access to, to, to some of the better information that we, can, we, we don't have to, and we, we use them for that. But absolutely, I think uh, uh, we, we, you have to do your own uh, reporting, and, but sometimes in these extraordinary cases, you need someone who has the access to be able to uh, provide you with some of the uh, uh, their clients to, to interview and, and enrich your story. Thank you, Diane. You you put in the chat your your new motto, <laughs> taken from uh, Gary. Do you have anything that you want to add about that? Yeah, I try and verify a bit through social media. I check Facebook to see if they're on it or. Um, Instagram or uh, sometimes even Twitter, and and you know, you, you, you know, that that has been helpful. Uh, and if they went through their passage through Mexico and they stopped at a particular albergue, a certain shelter, sometimes I'm able to call uh, someone who. Ah might be connected to that shelter and maybe find out a little bit more, not necessarily about that particular person, but about the circumstances of people coming through there. That's great. And when I talk to sources, I would say, I'm not going to use your name, your full name. I just wanna use a middle name or a nickname, or just your first name. And there was this whole hierarchy of attribution, which we have in the guide, starting with full name, first name, middle name, uh, nickname. And then the last would be a pseudonym, uh, really at the last resort. But then I would say, I just need, you have to tell me your full name, just so I have it. And what I did was put it on a post-it pad. I would actually show them my post-it pad so I could show it to my editor and I would tell them, the minute I show it to my editor, so we know, I rip it up. 
and I actually simulate that for them. So it, it gives them a little bit of security and they're wondering, oh, okay. So I take care of that. Uh, I'm just gonna veer off and ask one question about pseudonyms. Panel, yes, no, why? Armando. Um, I think in the in the most riskiest situations, yes, if that is what's standing between you and, and, and telling a, a really, really important story. And if this is the only way that this source feels comfortable in sharing the story, um, then I would say yes. Um, I personally actually have not had that experience yet where somebody has asked for a, a pseudonym. It's usually, you know, uh, please change my voice or only show uh, maybe just my hands, you know, things like that. Don't say my full name. Um, but I've never actually personally been asked for a pseudonym. Monica. We didn't, uh, we didn't allow pseudonyms on air. And so that was a newsroom policy. So, yeah. and, and that brings up a good point. You need to know your newsroom policy before you make up your own <laughs> and you need to talk to your editor about that. Diane. Newsroom policy against it. Yeah. And I, I like to explain why to sources that who, if they suggested it. And what do you tell them? It hurts credibility and not just hurts it. I think a better verb would be it crushes credibility. Yeah, crushes. I mean, there is sometimes a way around it. Um, for example, mother of three, the mother of three said, uh, the mother of three continued something like that. Right. Gary, your policy. Uh, we don't have a hard policy either way, but we don't use the name often because it, as uh, Diane said, there are ways to describe a person without to fabricating a name. And then it raises too many issues in the mind of the of the audience of the reader. <laughs> like, what, what, what is it? You, you fabricating this name. What makes me think that you didn't fabricate another name? So, exactly. you know, we just don't want to go there, but we don't have a hard policy at this, at the um, site for that. Right. You, you are not writing fiction. And yes. that is a really key point to remember. I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, do remember crushes credibility, not only for the terrific alliteration, but I think it will make people realize, oh, it's not just hurts, but it crushes. So let's switch gears just a little bit. And I want to isolate uh, Monica and Gary because I've promised all of you a discussion about Haiti. And so we're gonna have one question about Haiti here. And of course, Diane and Armando have been covering Haitian immigrants, um, but I wanna talk directly in Haiti. And, and Monica, I'll start with you. And this is, we've talked a lot about the safety of sources, but I want to ask you about the safety, well, your safety and the safety of reporters and how that actually impacts the way you do an interview. And I'm talking about traveling with a security team, uh, which may be necessary right now in Haiti. Tell me about your experience. Sure. Um, well, I went to Haiti, um, wasn't the first time, but the I went in November and but a lot of change since I'd been before. Um, and so I do what I, I did what I always do when I go traveling just about anywhere, anywhere is um, I talk to reporters who had been there recently. And then I talk to reporters who are there on the ground who I know and, and just asked, you know, what's the, take the temperature? What's it like? Where did you go? How is one place in the country different than the other? Going over kind of my story ideas, um, and walking through that process with folks who had just been there. And, and I do the same thing, you know, in Mexico, for example, which may seem okay, you know, a year ago, but things have changed um, and on the ground now. So um, I worked with a, a, an, an excellent field producer on the ground. We had lengthy conversations beforehand. I think it was at least two weeks of prep before I went, um, just speaking with him. And it was all about backup plans because at the time that I landed, um, Haiti was going through a, a security crisis, uh, which is ongoing, but also a fuel crisis. So what you had was a lack of fuel on the ground. So while you're thinking about kind of your safety throughout the day and which routes are safe and 
where should we go and not go? You're also thinking, are we gonna have enough gas to get there? And back? Um, so you have to go through a lot of logistics and go through, of course, just the general safety environment. And I stuck to my compass on what I wanted to cover. There were a lot of folks who were profiling gang leaders and members. That is not why I was there. I wanted to speak to folks who'd been deported back to Haiti and those who were thinking of still going. And I kind of, you know, stuck to my internal compass and did not feel that pressure to go and, you know, profile a gang leader, which is not the kind of story I wanted to do while I was there. Um, and I think that's important because when you're in a hot spot like that, you might feel that pressure to, you know, go do the, the big story. Um, the story you're doing will transcend that. It should. And, um, and, and just trust, you, trust your gut on that. It's always key to see where all the other reporters are going and then sometimes to go in the other direction. You sure. never know what you're gonna find. And nine times out of 10, you're gonna get that scoop. You're, you're gonna see something that other people aren't. On the other hand, if they're, they are going there, it, it could be for something that is breaking and dangerous and you, you might wanna uh, not only be careful, but make sure and monitor that you're not missing something. Gary, I want to ask you about how we here in, in the U.S., and you are, uh, your Haitian Times is based in New York, um, what we get wrong, <laughs> what immigration reporters or just other reporters may get wrong about Haiti and how you're trying to fix that. Well, I mean, uh, immigration reporters generally haven't focused on Haiti lately. For, for a long time. Most of the focus has been uh, on Central American migrants coming in. Uh, so, and the political foreign correspondents since the earthquake in 2010 have written very little about Haiti. And so right now you have a crop of correspondents who are on the beat covering Haiti who lack a lot of the background and the context. And so, the, 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 the story is very superficial because they can't really get to the heart of, all, or the heart of it all because it would be too much because they, they, don't, they can't understand it well enough to crystallize it for an audience, a mainstream audience. And so the reason for that is not entirely their fault or the editor's fault. I think part of the problem is that uh, you rely on folks on the ground. Uh, even the Haitian Times, you know, we 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 go in, we 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 rely because we're not there. Right now, there's a lack of quality journalists working in Haiti, because like everyone else, they've they've left too. I mean, journalists are not going to stay in, in under bad conditions because they're journalists. So you've had a migration of journalists out of the country, and so when you know. Monica or, or, or Diane or anyone goes there, you're looking for what the, your colleagues are reporting, but what your colleagues are reporting doesn't make any sense to you. And so you have to figure it out. And in the process, you come up with a solid story, but it, it lacks the, uh, the, the deep connective issues that will elevate the story in a way that can really sometimes move policy. Uh, and so I think that's what's going on. And, you know, the way we are addressing that at the Haitian Times, uh, because we fell victim to it as well, because we, we were just trying to figure something out, but nobody can explain it to us. Uh, and so we are going to open a robust Haiti Bureau. We are onboarding seven new reporters that we are going to train ourselves. I'm going to le be leading the training. And so have them write in Creole, send it us to us in New York, and then we'll we'll work on it. It's sort of like the old ways that Time Magazine and, and Newsweek uh, operated, um, and and so we're gonna uh, steal that model and you know rev up the coverage. You know, I I, I was telling uh, Liz the other day that I'm not really particularly fond of a uh, reporting because it's soon a little bit distant. We we almost sort of like looking at Haitians, but no, we are Haitian, and we should be covering Haiti from that perspective. And so uh, that's how, I, and I want that to be hopefully the guide that you know, my colleagues uh, can, can use 
when they have to parachute in Haiti for a story. Because the reality is, <laughs> Haiti is not going away. We can ignore it if we want as journalists, but it's not, the, the, the problems are still structural and they haven't been addressed yet. And they will come out uh, at some point in, in a way where it, it will force us to think of it. And when that reoccurs, the Haitian time wants to be ready to cover it the way it should. Awesome. If there are any Creole speakers here, <laughs> you know who to talk to if you're looking for a job or training. So that's uh, great. I, I love to see that there are journalists who are um, coming into the profession, and I can't wait to see what you do. So thank you for that. I want to move to the border. Uh, I know, Armando, you've got a big piece running tonight, and you may not be able to stay with us much past one o'clock. So I want to make sure that we have you here for a little bit. And if there's any questions for Armando, make sure you get them in. But for Armando and Diane, um, you both have been covering MPP, uh, the, the first version and now the second version. And Armando, you touched on it a little bit. Number one, what advice would you give for not only your own safety, but what you're seeing? Because it's not a safe place in Reynosa, Matamoros you are in as well, Diane. What have you seen? Um, and also, what are people, what are sources like there? Are they eager to tell their story or, or are they just saying back off? Armando. So for me, because of uh, deferred action. I'm unable to actually physically go to Mexico and quickly come back without advanced parole. But one of the things that we really wanted to stress was hiring somebody who's local to the area that might know, um, uh, who, who might be able to have a sense when things are turning either violent or unsafe, you know, who has a little bit more of a connection to that community than we do. Because I think one of the things that we do, especially in a breaking news situation, which I think is very harmful, but sometimes in some ways unavoidable is we parachute into a community or we parachute into a situation and we parachute back. We don't, you know, we don't stay there for a long period of time. So what we might leave behind when we make that speedy uh, uh, exit out of that situation is a lot of burned bridges. So I think the best thing that we could do is, is if possible, hire a local crew, talk to people who are involved in that. Um, for my case, it was Reynosa, who might be able to be a guide into those camps who already has some of those relationships, perhaps with some of the people in there. So Mireya was your uh, colleague who went there, is that right, uh, in Reynosa? Yes. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, she correct. did a great job. But so you're the producer on that. So you've already done all the legwork for her to go on. Um, but you're in McAllen, right? You're doing a lot of it on that side. Um, is there a difference uh, of people that you're talk to, talking to there? Just shed a little bit of light on, on what you're seeing. And I know uh, this is a report that came out on Thursday. Yeah, like, like I mentioned earlier today, I think, you know, being in, in in these camps is for some people the most dangerous part of their journey because they're there for a very long time. They're really at the mercy of a lot of the groups that uh, control uh, the area. So we certainly saw a lot of people having that fear and expressing that fear to us. Um, that's why you know we really try to go the extra length to make sure that the identities were concealed um, or you know that, that we weren't directly filming anybody on camera that we didn't already you know ask for permission. You know things like that that you can do. Um, one, one other thing that I wanted to mention was, you know, when we're talking about organizations that are sometimes the gateway to uh, those sources or to that information, just because uh, an immigrant has a relationship with that organization and trust that organization doesn't mean that you don't have to go the extra mile to also establish that trust and relationship with that person. Because while they may trust the organization, that doesn't mean they trust you. So, you know, I think that's one thing that I, I really try to do is, is explain, you know, why uh, we're out there, why we're trying to tell a story. When you work for a big network or a big company where your story might manifest in different ways, for example, a lot of my pitches start out as a, as a written piece, then we go for the shows and, you know, sometimes it's podcasts or radio. I think it's really important to be transparent with people as well to, to let them know, hey, if this ends up in an audio piece or if this ends up in a written piece, are you okay with that? Are you com comfortable with that? Why or why not? Or how can I help to make you feel comfortable? And do you ever uh, have to say when they tell you, you know, I'm not, do you back away? Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the most important thing that we can do is, is, is to make sure that, you know, that people feel safe. And, you know, when, when you're out in, into a field, when you're out in the field, you're a representative of journalism and journalists all across the world, you know, the industry as a whole. So you want to make sure that the next interaction that that person has with the journalist isn't tainted by, by your interaction with them. I know you gave me a few cringe-worthy examples of journalists. <laughs> uh, do you want to just share one? This is a what not to do. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, and, and I think people might have different perspective of this, but um, I was a, a campaign embed on the campaign trail in 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago, but <laughs> uh, there were a dozens, well, I should say several, several uh, presidential candidates stopping by Homestead Detention Center where some of the unaccompanied minors were being detained for, for a period of time, and it was just a media frenzy outside the gates of that that detention center because you know there were reporters with telephoto lenses on ladders shooting over the fences trying to get close-ups of the faces and you know i argue that just because there is an absence of a parent at that moment doesn't mean that that child uh you know doesn't deserve that same respect that you know you, you would give to any other child in any other given situation so while in some situations you might ask for permission from the parent hey, can I film your child um, or them directly just because you can't doesn't mean you can do that. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how that uh, reporting manifested. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, the, the faces were blurred or uh, shot at a wide angle so that we weren't zeroing, zeroing in on, on any and of And you did kids. that. Yeah, you did that with the sidewalk school that was in the report uh, from last week. Yeah. And so you see the adults, but the children are, are um, fuzzy, uh, which is great. Um, terrific. Diane, you're, you're thinking about everything Armando is saying. Um, what did you discover? I know you had that great video on the Dallas Morning News site about your, your time in Matamoros. Um, what, what did you discover covering there uh, as far as people's openness? And how important is it for you to assess the danger to yourself before going in? It's extremely important to assess the danger uh, and to know about the warring cartels going on in that part of, of Mexico. Um, it's different in Matamoros compared to Reynosa. And it's really important to talk to Mexicans, not uh, Mexican-Americans on the Texas side only, or not just uh, attorneys on the on the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. You really need to get that ground truth from people in Mexico. Uh, we we at one point even looked into hiring security, and we uh, my colleague Alfredo Corchado said, you know, that will draw even more attention to you. You're gonna have a target on you if you do that. And I thought, yeah, you're right. And in both those camps, it's really easy to uh, cross the border and be inside the camp within five, five minutes, really, five to 10 minutes. You are there. They're, they were so close to, to the border turnstiles. So that made it a lot easier, of course, for a mother with two children, she's there at night. Yeah. Or even in Reynosa, um, you're talking to men and they're there at night. They don't know where they are exactly. They got ex quote unquote expelled back quickly at midnight or two in the morning. And they're not quite sure where they are. And so some of them would stay and hug the, the Mexican government building right at the turnstiles. And I kept on hearing about how they were there um, and expelled or in their minds deported at, at night. And that, that became a story too about the danger of that. And we, we the US, have uh, protocols on not doing that. And clearly they were not being followed. Wow. And I must say that, you know, again, I wasn't there at night to assess danger. They were. Yes. Uh, and then if you're going to go farther out from where the camps are into apartments where some immigrants 
live because uh, rent is cheaper and they have the money. You, you really have to think that through as well. And who's going to be your driver? And can you trust the driver? And is the driver, taxi cab driver, really a uh, halcón for the cartel, a lookout for the cartel? And you talk to local journalists to find out who's the cab driver that they trust to take you around. Monica, it, I, I would love for you to jump in because Diane just brought up a great point about attracting attention. And you never want to be the story, but you also want to be safe. You had a great uh, comment about that. Well, yeah, in, in, in Haiti, for example, and I think this can be the case for many other places in the world, if you go with an outlet, um, that that organization may require a certain amount of security. And that's something that, you know, is there any sort of way to think about that more creatively or consider those strict rules sometimes. Um, I know that the, the folks that I worked with uh, in Haiti had really difficult times with other outlets when it came to the security that the other outlets required and yeah. that they felt that, you know, having some big black SUV going around, you know, Port-au-Prince made things more dangerous. And um, sometimes it seemed like the knowledge and experience of folks on the ground in the place was overlooked for outlets, outlet policies that were crafted in like New York or Washington DC. So it just seemed like there was a disconnect going on. And I certainly have seen that over the years. So it's just something to keep in mind. Is there flexibility there or is, can you have more, more of a conversation with, with um, whoever you're working for? Right, so it was just you and your colleague in Haiti who went around and it seemed like that was a lot less obvious. <laughs> At that time, yeah, right. Yeah. And that's not for everybody. Um, right. and, and every circumstance can be different. And so, you know, I don't want to speak for folks who've done this differently and felt good about that. But I think it just um, these hard and fast policies sometimes I think can backfire. Great. So I would love to show uh, one of the videos that we have just started producing at Define American because I think it will really initiate a, a great discussion of what immigration reporting is today. And it is about Monica, uh, Jose mentioned it, and uh, she is really reimagining what immigration reporting can be and has been. So I'll just share this for a little bit. And Armando, whenever you need to leave, we totally understand, but definitely have a little watch here. And I think you can see this, all right. My name is Monica Campbell. I'm an independent immigration editor and reporter. I work in both audio and print. I've been covering immigration for about 15 years. We see the immigrant story rise up when it's sometimes a novelty. What I always try and advocate is that this shouldn't be just in the corner of, you know, the immigration corner. This needs to be something that's woven throughout a newsroom. You know, sports, politics, culture, music, all of this is a part of it. We've had different iterations of this beat. It's been called the demographics beat, the minority affairs beat. Now it's the immigration beat. It might be called something else in a year. Frankly, I think we'll look back on, I don't know how many more years, but we'll look back and say, you know, why did we have people even dedicated to immigration? Shouldn't we have had people weaving the American experience of all ways that we see it into every part of our coverage? So much fun. <laughs> I do want to, I, I have one caveat there. Um, I, I think it's really important to have folks who specialize in, in immigration policy. I think that's like incredibly important. And so I don't want to minimize that at all. I just think that sometimes immigration coverage can be seen as um, it's like the separate bucket. And I think that's, um, you know, we've seen that with race coverage throughout the years and how there's been an evolution of that. And there's a correction of that going on still. And I think immigration is, is just side by side. Um, you know, can be looked at in that way. And we see um, immigrant and people who are immigrants in the United States often put in some sort of separate bucket as if they are not part of an industry or a school or a community or politics, but only when there's a spotlight or a reason to do that. 
um, instead of instead of weaving it more in. So I just want to uh, I just wanted to to you know put a caveat on the importance of specializing in the policy as it evolves. It's very important. Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, you need to be experts. You have to understand the law and how it relates. So you can do the story with as much background and detail and ask the best questions. On the other hand, you're right. Why should we siloize, siloize this? Um, and I just have to make a very funny comment. That video actually of the newsroom is the New York Times. It was right near where one, my desk was at one point, and it's at the center of the newsroom, not in a corner, but it was a stock photo. So a little inside information on that. All right, so before you have to go, I'd love for you to just comment on this idea of perhaps sometime in the future integrating immigration coverage into all areas, because it really is a novelty. And sometimes editors will be like, oh, well, Trump's no longer president. And there's really not an issue going on now. And, you know, they don't see the importance. Well, family separation isn't happening. Why is it so important for people to understand that this is not just politically related and that it is part of America? I think one of the most important things that I can do as journalist and to use these platforms to change the perception of what an immigrant looks like, of what an immigrant might be, who it might be, and what uh, what issues might be related to immigration. You know, I like to argue that when there's a natural disaster, even here in the United States, and people are displaced and they have to move to another area for a per, for a for a, a a short period of time, that's migration happening maybe in a micro level, but it's still immigration. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. I think that's what Del Rio showed us, showed a lot of the world um, uh, that, that immigrants don't fit under a specific uh, stereotype. And, you know, whatever we can do to keep chipping away and changing the perception of that, I think it's really important. I think, you know, as, a, as an industry as a whole, we have to ask ourselves, what's the difference between an expat and an immigrant? You know, is it the color of their skin? How is it that we, uh, um, define uh, immigration and define migrant populations. Well said. Do I, your I, editors, I, yeah, go I, for I, it, I, jump I, in, Gary. That, you know, when you look at places like LA, San Francisco, New York, Boston, these communities rely on new Americans, let's put it this way. And so to me, not to integrate them in your reporting, is 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 my practice because you know they are the fabric of those communities and so you can it doesn't have to be a binary choice like okay do we integrate or do we live in a silo you can do both and you should do both because on the one hand you know you have to educate and inform your core readers about the people they run into every day without thinking about who these people are you have to make that connection so that when people uh, spew racism and hatred vows, that you know it, it's it's not for lack of knowledge that they're just like a bad person, just a racist, and that, and there's nothing you can do. The deplorables, the court, you know, the the, the email lady, and, and so you know we 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 need to find a, a way to do that because the the children of these new americans are going to be your future readers and you need to contact connect with them right now because if you don't they're going to go away and so from a business standpoint you know just as we make the same argument for diversity coverage diversity of coverage is as important and if you don't do that then i don't care you know how much you invest in anything you won't have a reader base especially at the local level you know at a local level national or even international uh, uh, targeted publications like the Times, the Wall Street Journals, and all of the others, and the networks. But local media has to be what covers immigrants at its forefront. And then, of course, then the, the, the national media. Again, we're talking about the ecosystem from the bottom up. And, and so that's, that's really the focus. We have to cover that. Otherwise, our business, from a business, I'm putting my publisher's hat now. You won't <laughs> have an audience to, to interact with and to engage with. And, and that's really bad news. If I'm worried about something, it's about that because I don't see us the integration with new Americans and, and, and the communities and newsroom. That's not being made, and, and and we need to quicker, quickly pivot toward that. 
look, all politics is local and <laughs> all stories do originate in a community level. I know we had had some people covering farm workers here on, on the chat. Uh, this is what's so essential. I look at the stories of refugees and immigrants in Utica, New York and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I know USA Today just did a big series about that as well. But look to the local press who have been covering this even longer. Um, I know you are on a very big push uh, for community media, Center for Community Media at CUNY. I know, Daniela, <laughs> you are part of that as well. Um, and this is also being talked about in Congress, a bill for funding. So while we have the National Association of Hispanic Journalists here, I also want to point very local, whether it be the Columbia journalism students um, and also smaller outlets. And so you can take a lot of what we have learned today and what we've talked about and apply it locally. Is there, uh, first of all, I'd love to see questions. So please ask any questions to our panelists because we've got about 10 minutes left in this. And I know everybody's probably on deadline right now. I don't want to, um, I don't want to hold you back, but I would love to ask a fun question, kind of a rapid fire question, maybe 60 second answer of your favorite non policy story that you uh, covered as a reporter that just made you smile and and perhaps got a lot of great reader reaction. Diane, I'll start with you. I did a story on a choir, a high school choir in a, an extremely diverse neighborhood of Dallas. And the kids were from all over the planet. <laughs> and it, it was just fun to see them come together around music. And, and um, one of them was trying to become an opera singer even. She was from Cuba. That was delightful. And we did video and uh, you know it was just a fun story. That's great. Gary? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Put me on the spot. I don't know. I guess it will probably be my first front page story uh, in the New York Times. It was a profile of this kid who, uh, years later, he had been um, bullied at school and set ablaze. And then uh, because he wouldn't, uh, these kids were trying to offer him drugs. And he wouldn't take it. And he became sort of like a Nancy Reagan kind of uh, rallying around him with her Just Say No campaign. And so when I got to the Times, I had known about the story. I reached out to him and just talk about what his life was like. And I think in many ways, he, that story foreshadowed uh, the evolution of the Haitian community. So I always remember that story. Great. Armando. A few years ago, we sent out digital cameras to his entire refugee camp so that children could document their daily lives. So they took pictures and it, it, the, the photographs that they that they took were just so heartfelt and so just wonderful and beautiful in such a way. And I think that project itself, um, you know, kind of shows a little bit of what I would like to do in the future more is just to, to provide a platform for people to tell their stories the way that they want to tell it. You know, I think as journalists, we, we like to talk a lot, but I, I argue that that we should, <laughs> me and myself included, but we should, you know, we should listen more than we talk. And um, I think, you know, the, if we do that, we can get insight to some pretty cool story ideas. Wow, I've been fascinated listening to you <laughs> and everyone here. Monica, your favorite story. And then I have a question that's gonna go a little further afield, Monica. Um, it was kind of one off. I was reporting on um, some changes when it came to farm worker and immigration policies in the US in California and the Central Valley. And one gentleman who had been in touch with for a while was going grocery shopping. And so I did a story an audio radio story um, about him going through the produce and fruit aisle. And he explained how um, kind of the hierarchy of what it meant to pick strawberries and onions and potatoes and through his eyes. So I kind of saw the grocery aisles through his eyes and how it, um, what it meant, like how he kind of ranked the, you know, the, the fruits and vegetables from like pain in the ass to like, I really like working with this one. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I never looked at an onion the same again after that. 
Oh, wow. Was there one vegetable you didn't recognize? Well, no, just because the the onion was really, t- really tough for him to harvest. And I didn't, I had never seen the onion like through that sort of light. Um, and it resonated. It was like this incredibly popular story because people, I think, kind of shopped different, like saw their produce aisle through his eyes after listening to that radio program. Um, and it, it just kind of hit home for a lot of people. Food is such a universal topic. And it's, it's, it has so many stories, as many layers as an onion, in fact. So Armando, before you have to leave, I may uh, just jump in and ask you a very quick question, if, if possible, even though it leads to a much longer answer. But what do you, as a DACA recipient, bring to this beat that nobody really has seen or perhaps your editors needed some time to adjust to? What are the insights that you bring? Well, I think because of this immigration um, status, which I inherited, just like the color of my skin, I there is the idea that somebody is an undocumented journalist. And I like to argue that I'm a journalist that happens to be undocumented. So while I never want to become part of the story for anything, any reason when I'm reporting about immigration, I do recognize that because of my uh, uh, status, I have specific insights um, that other reporters who are tackling the same story might not. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that I really try to drive uh, to to draw from. And you know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people, you know, there's still I'm very new to this beat, <laughs> so you know, there's still this this uh, uh, imposter syndrome. Is it you know maybe uh, for lack of a better term, but. You know, I did a ride along with CBP, you know, last week Um, or, you know, just interviewing people on the other side of the border, just talking to them, you know, and just thinking that if the situations were just a little bit different, I literally would have been on the other side, but I'm not. I'm here reporting their story. So, you know, there's little things like that that are always kind of like pinch me moments for me, but you know, I want to do my best to, to, to bring those sensitivities um, and, and you know, uh, protect our sources, but also just, you know, get these stories out and challenge the way that we think of uh, uh, immigration and uh, uh, immigrant as, as people. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all. I, I would be remiss if I did not have this wonderful nod to another uh, top reporter, another leader in our business. And that's Elliot from the AP. (laughs) Uh, Elliot in the yellow uh, jersey here. May I call on you for a second? This is what happens when you're a teacher and you see people and they're they're around. Uh, um, We're thrilled, thrilled that you're here. And hopefully you've had a good time listening to everybody and just nodding along. But the Associated Press is so important in how you communicate standards uh, and how you change language and how you, I know one of our big pushes in um, in the spring was making sure that you, we didn't have, journals were not saying surge and flood when it came to um, the increase in migrants at the border. What are your uh, policies on anonymous sources. I assume that pseudonyms are off the table as well. Is that a discussion at the AP? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for your uh, for this discussion and for the guide. I, I'm doing one of my big priorities right now is doing an immigration guide for reporters across the AP who don't have a lot of experience and might be intimidated by a lot of the laws and the policies, which are, are very complicated, but as you said, very important. Um, you know, and so trying to trying to just a, a big challenge is trying to draw more people into the coverage instead of just the same five or six reporters. Um, we are doing that guide, and then I'm also we're also doing a major revamp of the style uh, book, AP style wow. book that I, I hope comes out this week. I've heard that before, but we've been working on it for about nine months now, and addresses addresses a lot of these questions. The anonymous source one is a tough one. I'll, I would just echo what everyone else said. I mean, we don't we don't use pseudonyms. Um, we have, of course, a very strict policy for anonymous sources, but that's more in the political realm. Um, it, it, I think with immigration, because there are so many good reasons for people to uh, protect their privacy, we, we generally grant, grant the anonymity. Um, yeah, um, I, I was, I, I was going to, I got, I have like 10 different things I wrote down that, that were really interesting. Oh, so good. it's been good. a really good conversation. 
I mean, you're a reporter as well as a coordinator and edit editor. Why do you think people are not flocking to cover this? I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's the best beat ever. Yeah, I mean, there was, uh, you know, Diane, and I know Monica and some several of you here have been around uh, for a long time. Um, it was pretty, when we compare it today to like Obama administration, even Bush administration, it's much better. Of course, when Trump got elected, it was just, you know, a major expansion of immigration coverage. And yeah, it's it's let up a little bit, but the conditions are, are if anything, more interesting. You know, I was in Yuma last two weeks ago, and I was there for three mornings and saw probably hundreds of Venezuelans, Cubans, Haitians, Russians, zero Mexicans, zero Central Americans. So it's that's something that's really changed in the last year or two. So it's it's always changing. The numbers were very high last year. Um, so I, I will backtrack though because I didn't answer your question uh, on on the surge. That is part of our uh, the, your, your, the 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 the, the uh, language. There's a lot of hot areas like the one is of course undocumented, illegal, unauthorized. How do you describe it? That's a, a perennial issue. But um, we we have an entry that says you know avoid any any language that is uh, sort of conjure, conjures or suggests war or natural disaster. So surge, flood, uh, onslaught, avalanche, anything like that. Um, you know, avoid it. Tidal wave. Tidal right. wave. <laughs> um, I, if I could, I, I know you're leaving in one minute, but I was really intrigued. One of the challenges I have, I, I've done a lot of reporting on the border and a lot of what Diane and others and Monica have said is, is resonates with me in terms of like, where do you approach people? How do you approach people? But your, your comments at the beginning about how to approach immigrants, I'm guessing the more away from the border, you said uh, community fairs, dinners, that's an area where I'm really trying to get other people to, um, you know, not be so attached to the advocates. I mean, even though that could be a, a way to start, but just more exposed. I mean, this di story that Diane told of, of three years following a Ukrainian and then having the story come out today is that's super impressive. And, um, you know, I just trying to trying to find ways to do more of that. That's terrific. If you have any other questions any other for ideas. our panelists, you're welcome. But we're, I'm okay. so thrilled that you uh, are taking notes and any way that Define American, NAHJ, all of the panelists here can help, please engage. Um, okay. I, my husband actually works for the AP Spanish News Service and wrote the oh, really? Spanish style guide. So, uh, well, we keep it all in the family here, <laughs> journalists. So happy well, to thanks. help. It's a great, great effort you're, you're doing. And I'm, I've already passed along your guide. Terrific, thank you so much. And we have a few more minutes for questions from our illustrious audience. In fact, this was so engaging that Armando, I hope you don't uh, you know, miss your, your screening, but thanks so much for staying over. You know, Just tell the editors it was way more important. Um, does, any last questions or before I uh, get to some summaries from um, all of our panelists, but there are so many people on here and you're all journalists, please ask some questions. No, all right, Daniela, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> what, what's the one thing you learned today? I mean, you can never learn enough even as we've been doing this or, or one takeaway that you will give to your students. I mean, I would say a few different things. Um, it's been great to see everyone here. Armando, I thought, you know, the way in which you're coordinating cross-border reporting, I thought was really interesting. And to be on the border, but not be able to cross the border without going through advanced parole, but still playing a role. And I think that's important for so many of us that also, you know, came through during the pandemic is like, it's critical to be on the ground, but how do we also work with colleagues and figure out ways to do more collaboration in the reporting? Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Diane, I feel like is always the person who's the boots on the ground, no matter what, like, I, you know, if you follow Diane, I feel like even when you weren't reporting for the Dallas Morning News, when for like a moment they made a mistake and not having you there, you were still reporting. And I think that of just being there, especially for those of us who aren't, on, I mean, I'm in LA, so I'm not that far from the border, but for journalists who aren't on the border, it's, you don't have to be on the border to report on immigration. And I, I thought that Monica's point to the idea that this beat, yes, we need experts who understand the policies and that should be every, but at the same time, everyone should have a basic understanding of those policies as well. And that immigrants aren't 
only people who are undocumented and that people aren't only from Latin America. And so what Gary, who always brings the perspective of these waves going through, you know, for a hot moment, people are interested in Haiti. And I remember when we had this um, meeting like in June and was it in June and talking about what was about to happen with Haiti, but there were very few reporters at the time that we could find which were focused on Haiti or paying attention to what was happening going through Panama. And it's a lot to cover. So anyways, these are some disparate thoughts, um, but- Terrific. Really interesting. Thank you. I love calling on you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks for your work in the chat. And by the way, we all miss migratory notes. I think we can just collectively say, thank you for all the work you did, Daniela. And we wish it were still going in operation. So two questions from Gisela uh, from Colombia and Kara. Um, and Monica, I'm going to start with you because you actually in our guide say this. Have you ever been in a position where your source wants to use their name and you advise against it? Great question. Um, I'm, I'm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and because, and I'm trying to think of, I mean, it's because it's happened a couple of times where they would say, yes, you know, sure, we're there. And then I said, you know, let's just take a minute and walk through what it means to speak to me. Have you spoken to a reporter before in your life? No. Okay. Um, here's the website. This can be here in English, English and Spanish. It's a national outlet, et cetera, et cetera. And it just took a beat um, to talk about that. And then sometimes folks want to go and perhaps have a conversation with their partner or their family. And I found that that was sometimes better then speaking to somebody and then getting a panicky call from them later in the day where they said, you know, I just spoke to so-and-so and they're freaking out and now you're in this bind. Um, yeah. So I, that's, yeah, I have done that. Um, and I think it's, um, I think it's perfectly fine to right. just not advise, say, don't give me your name, but let's talk a little bit more about it. Right. And, and still give agency to, right. so they understand but Gisela, your point where your professor would say they don't understand. Well, maybe they do. And if they don't, then it's your call as a reporter to say, I'm not comfortable because I don't think they get it. Remember, the internet lives forever, and especially now, and especially social media. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, the other question was about user-generated content. And, and Gary, I may go to that. Citizen journalism, you've done your work in citizen journalism, says Kara. Um, and, and this is a lot to do with engaging the community, I think. What are your thoughts on the safety risks related to citizen journalism? That's interesting. Um, and obviously anybody who has a Twitter account can be involved in that. Um, and, and what would you perhaps use this question in advising your new reporters, seven new reporters in Haiti? Well, of course, uh, as uh, Monica found out when she went to Haiti and how quickly things can change on the ground in Haiti. And then we've been living through that ch rapid change. And the security situation is very, very precarious right now. So our reporters, you know, I'm, we're gonna tell them you know, interview their, their, their neighbors, you know, because their neighbors are living the story, they're legitimate sources, so that you don't really don't want to take, you don't have to take the necessary risk. Um, citizen journalism is, is, is a method, believe it or not, that we utilized last summer during the assassination of the president because we just didn't have enough people on the ground. So we recruited a bunch of people and told them and send them money to buy equipment. And then we, we they spent fan out across the country and reporting uh, stories for us that we process in New York. And so this is the, the, the first uh, uh, idea when we have about how we're gonna form our team because we, we had some experience using people who had no um, journalistic skills. And so we felt that it was a plus because they didn't have any bad habits. So we just have to give them very strict uh, instructions and they follow them to the T. And, and so we, we that's how we're going to build a, a, a team right now, because for the most part, you know, the old ways, the print guys, we never took the risk. It was always the photographers and the videographers who yeah. took the risk. Somebody could always describe what happened to us. But uh, 
that's the lens with which we come through this because you know I was in Haiti last time I was in Haiti was last January 2021. And this is the longest I've ever stayed away from Haiti in wow. 30 years of covering Haiti uh, because it's so dangerous. I, I, I really don't want to risk, you know, getting kidnapped because it's it, it's real. And so we, 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 we want to get folks on the ground, but not put them in, in, in dangerous situation for no particular reasons. Right. Thank you for that. One last question very quickly, uh, and then we'll conclude. And I'll address this to Diane. It was about covering children, undocumented children. And we do have a section on this in uh, the anonymous sources guide about being extra specially careful in not only how you photograph or don't photograph, but how you use their name because these children will grow up. What is your, um, what is your advice in protecting children when you report on them? To report on them like a mother. Oh. What would you want your child to say? What would you be comfortable with? And I've I try and get have the the parent right there sometimes, and of course ask permission. And sometimes they seem flattered. The parent seems flattered. Um, and. Um, other times the parent hasn't been there. There was a situation in Dallas where unaccompanied minors were being kept in buses overnight instead of in the convention center. And uh, we were able to get some photos of that, uh, but the children were in, the teens, I should say, were in silhouettes. You really couldn't tell who it was unless maybe you were the mother and you recognized your son's curls, right? But that, that, was, that was how we handled it. And we really needed to tell that story. That, that was a horrible a, a situation, a horrible abuse. Right. I mean, we are always under this pressure, not just competition, but to tell a story, to be accountable, to make change, but at the same time to do so without jeopardizing the people the very people, vulnerable people that you are reporting on. I think that is a perfect note to conclude on. And I appreciate that everybody has a busy schedule as we are reporters and uh, journalism adjacent folks. Um, I wanted to uh, just share briefly what our toolkit cover is. And this actually is of a, um, a young adult who was applying for SIG, Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. And this picture, which is our cover, uh, was, I thought, really artfully done and shaded in a way that um, shows that he is a, a young man, um, but not much else. And uh, I work very closely with our photographer on this. So I urge you to go to the guide because there is a whole section on visual storytelling and photography. And just, I know all these pictures because they were accompanying my stories at the New York Times. So I work very closely with the photographer and that can be a great advantage. I know Gary, you were saying usually the photographer goes in, but these days you're kind of a, a package and uh, take advantage of that. So I'd love, um, uh, Yuan, if you wanna put on the, the screen here. So just a few things that we have covered today. Um, this is in the last page of the guide and you can read all of these, um, but I think I'm gonna skip to number eight. Remember that sources are doing us a favor by talking to journalists and they don't have to talk to us. And you never want to make this to be something that is pressure. You want to negotiate the highest level of attribution, but also understand when to back off. So I say negotiate, but be sure to communicate. And so you can go to our guide. Uh, that would be the next slide. And we have a link to that. Uh, there it is at Define American. Please feel free to check out all of our resources, including the report on the mental health toll on DREAMers that we did. Um, and then just a plug for NAHJ. Oh my goodness, 
What an amazing operation. Thank you so much. Uh, terrific organization. I hope to see all of you in Vegas. Uh, I will be there as well. Um, so thank you for joining us on behalf of NAHJ and Define American. Yes, I gave the ad for Vegas. Of course you have the perfect Vegas sign. Um, and just really what a delight it was to be able to share the stage today, the discussion. I learned so much. I had a great time. And the fact that Elliot is here taking notes, I hope all of you took notes. Feel free to find us on Twitter, Liz Robbins at defineamerican.com. You can find me and hopefully we will all keep in touch. Um, those are my final words. Is there, and, and you can just take off the, the screen there, Yuan, and uh, anything else anybody wants to say, we've talked for a while. Diane, one sentence, what would you like to say? <laughs> it can be a thank you if you'd like. <laughs> this is America's or origin story and we should embrace it and, and cover it fully. Perfect. Gary? I, I, I second that. Uh, because you know that's what I, I, I um, re refer to us as the new Americans, because uh, uh, if you're trying to other us, it would not work well. Perfect, Monica, bring us home. Oh, um, it's this can be a cyclical story. Unfortunately, it can be a story only seen through the lens of a crisis, and I would just report against that as much as possible. Perfect. I've already said enough. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Please feel free to reach out with any questions and read the guide and um, be safe. Okay, take care everybody. Goodbye. Thank you so Bye. much again, NAHJ. Thank you to all the panelists.